You're currently serving a 13 year sentence. You were sentenced in January of 2020 uh, for indecent behavior with a juvenile. You have a parole eligibility date, which is later this year, December 27th. You don't earn good time. So your full term date is December 26, 2031. Does all that sound correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. And so, Mr. Foray, your case has been assigned to me, so I'll take the lead on the interview. Um, so you, um, how old are you, sir? 65. And how long have you been in jail? I'd say a total of five years, all of, all of uh, 2019 up until the current date. So you, you've been in jail five of, 13 years, right? Five. Five years of your 13 year sentence is what I'm, what I'm trying to get at. Okay. And what's your education level? High, uh, high school GED. Okay. So um, the victim in this case, how old was she? I believe 13. Okay, and you are her caregiver? Well, uh, uh, her father and her younger sibling uh, lived with us for, I'd say, about a year. Right, and you put her on the bus and that kind of stuff. I saw that she got to school and so forth. Yes, um, uh, I mean, that lived at our residence. Um, so, you know, we supplied meals and of course they live rent free. And uh, okay. And purchase all I, the, you know, I saw that you were, you were helping the dad, uh, her, 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 at least her dad, um, yeah. doing yeah. work established. I do see this. And yeah. um, so, you sexually assaulted uh, Haley uh, on multiple occasions. We, that's what the record reflects. Uh, do, no. you dis, do you dispute that? Yes, ma'am, because I was charged with indecent behavior. Well, what, I admitted to that. I accept responsibility for that, ma'am. You, but you entered a plea deal. You had a plea agreement. Yes, ma'am. And and the record clearly reflects that you sexually assaulted the 12-year-old child on multiple occasions over the course of a couple of years. Uh, and actually, you and she had um, sexual relations three or four times during that two-year period. Have you been to, I see in your record that you've taken some sex offender treatment. Have you completed all phases of that program? I'm, I'm currently in phase four. Good. So what have you learned so far in phases one through three? What have you learned about you? I've learned um, to take accountability. And uh, just, you know, I'm the, I'm the adult in the room and I'm, I know I'm, I've done wrong, and I accept that. And uh, another thing I've, I've learned, um, my first time being incarcerated, um, I thought I was uh, on an island alone, and I'm not, and I'm strengthening myself through the uh, through the class and other classes as well. I've done twelve step. Yeah, I'm taking all that in a. You know, this is this is all all new. For for me, the the, the lifestyle, but um, I'm I'm better. I've bettered myself, not only through, not only through the BETG classes, but through. Uh, the twelve step and through ministry. And I'm I'm just I'm not that I'm not that person anymore. I've I've learned to let that burden go and give that to a higher power. 
Good. So you mentioned the 12 step. You had uh, some substance abuse issues? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Uh, I elected to do that just for the fellowship because uh, we all have demons, we all have addictions, and that that was mine. And okay. uh, I've, learned, I've learned from that. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, you must know that there is uh, opposition that's been expressed uh, to any consideration for early release for you. Uh, and I'm just going to make you aware of it from the DA's office in St. Charles Parish, from the Sheriff's office in St. Charles Parish, and also um, victim opposition. Uh, I do see that, um, let's see, you, you got a write-up in, you only have two, and the last I see was October of 2022. That was a contraband write-up. What was the contraband? Not being able to uh, urinate. For the drug test? Excuse me? Didn't take the drug test? Yes, ma'am. And I've, I've rectified that because that was a medical issue. And after the, the second write-up for that, I, uh, I got to see the doctor where I could have access to a catheter. Okay. And that, and, that, and that was okay. And since then, that issue has been taken care of. And, uh, so have you ever tested positive for a drug screen? No, ma'am. Okay. I'm drug-free, right. alcohol-free, smoke-free. Yeah. Warden, what can you tell us about Mr. Foray? Uh, I can say his duty status does have a catheter thing on it from the doctor. Um, he's been pretty low-key since he's been here. That's regular speaks for itself after that. Thank you. Press, so. Oh, I'm sorry. Press. I did miss saying he is he has qualified for our honors program. Oh, good. Our press. press. That's what he was saying. Okay, good. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions. So uh we'll hear from Mr. Brian Foray at this time. Mr. Mr. Brian. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, Madam Chair, members of the board, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to address you today. Uh, I'm really here, I've elected to be here as a character reference for my brother and to really to uh, ask for his consideration for parole, obviously. But you know, I can tell you that uh, as long as I've known my brother, I've never known him to be violent, or dishonest, or really even a deviant, or to even behave outside uh, the normal legal boundaries. It just wasn't him. So when all this occurred, it was a total shock to me and the rest of my family, really. So it's no, uh, it, it's, I'm not surprised that he would admit he'd made a terrible mistake because his actions uh, were reprehensible. And so I, I do see, and I'm glad to hear that he takes full responsibility. We've talked about that several times. And I think he's come to accept the judgment and the penalty of his actions. Uh, we've, we've talked numerous times during the week. We correspond and, uh, and I try to visit as often as I can be back to him. Uh, and I can tell you that I've seen him uh, metamorphose over the last year or so as he's uh, taken, taken uh, what he's done and the consequences of his actions to heart. So, uh, but whether this is enough uh, and whether justice has been served is for you guys to decide that. Uh, but in my heart, in my mind, if true habilitation is one of the main objectives of, of his incarceration, uh, I believe he's absolutely ready for a second chance here because uh, this is really his first time in in uh, you know in any kind of problems with with the law. I know that he's tried to be a model prisoner. I know that he's taken advantage of just about every opportunity afforded him in the way of classes and programs. 
to improve himself. Uh, we talk about all of that. Uh, I, I do know that he has taken uh, part in the 12 Steps programs because I have been in Al-Anon myself over the years and uh, have uh, encouraged him to take advantage of those type of things. Uh, and I do know he, he's also uh, adopted a, a practice of personal reflection in his life, which is good. So, you know, I know and I see that it's helping him with his uh, personal journey. Uh, and so there's no doubt in my mind that he has paid a price for his crime above the time that he served and the loss of his personal freedom. Uh, it's been uh, the source of the breakup of his family, the loss of his livelihood, the separation of his, from his parents, from his children and his grandchildren. And it's a price that uh, we have all had to pay, not just him, uh, because of his actions. And I would like to take the opportunity, uh, if I could, just to share one example of this, and I'll try to be brief. But over the past year or so, uh, Claude, while he was inmate, both of my parents passed away. Uh, and he could not be there for the passing. And I cared for them through their time of cancer and their treatments and the period of hospice care and their final death and all the arrangements that required and the resolution of their estates. And for a while, I held a bit of a resentment toward my brother uh, for not being around to help. But with all of that, excuse me. With all of that, I know that my younger brother has always been much closer. And I know that for him not being there excuse me, took a significant toll on him and I. And I know that his arrest, his trial and conviction and incarceration was a deep emotional blow. And it was never one they recovered from. Mr. Foray, I know this is really emotional for you and I don't want to cut you off, but we need you to wrap it up, sir. So I'll just end that he knows this and he will have to live with that for the rest of his life as well. So my only point in making all this was that it's more than just the time served, but you guys know that. And you not you guys know that the toll that crime pay crime takes on not just the victims, but on the families. I would just like to say that in closing for this is that uh we have uh, my wife and I help him during his uh his his custody. Uh, and we also have made uh, agreed to make uh, arrangements for him for if and when he gets out for some financial resources to be available for him to make a second start. And I can tell you that one of his six children has also agreed to make provisions and to provide for a place for him to live uh, for employment and, uh, and to help him with the work that he'll need for the conditions of his parole. So. I look forward to once again him being out and free and and you know I probably am closer now with my brother than I've ever been. I am there is six years difference, but I've got to know him in ways before. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And thank you again for letting me take the time your time to do this. And we where are you calling us from? Uh, my wife and I are retired now. We live in Florida. Okay. I just didn't recognize the area code. I'm glad you uh, yeah, took time. I'm, uh, I'm a, a graduate of LSU and uh, have had a career, a successful career there as an architect. And now I'm retired and I try to get back and 
take care of him as best I can. So, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us today. Let me ask uh, Mr. Claude: Is there anything you'd like to say to wrap it up for us? Yes, ma'am. I'd like. Let me prove to you that our system works. That you know, second chances do work. And hopefully you make the right decision to grant parole. Well, I can be a productive law abiding a citizen once again. I can I mean it, I did consider at one time myself a, a good father and a good husband good employer, great employer. And uh, I was I was very successful as well. Uh, I didn't do the same kind of work my brother did, but uh, I did have steady work. I don't ever recall going unemployed since I've been 15 years old. So I've done 15 years in the oil field. I've done some driving. I've done a little bit of everything to provide. So I, um, I have a feeling of uh, penitent, uh, uh, regret for having done wrong, and I take full responsibility and, and accountability for that. Uh, a cleansing of my inventory, so to speak, uh, ministry through our fellowship programs here. And um, just I'll just want to close out to say uh, for me, it's, it's, it's been a very humiliating and humbling experience, but nothing compares to the damage I've done. And I can only just try to make things better, just make things right and uh, reassure you, I'm, this will right. never happen again. Um, that's that's pretty much all I can say. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And, and uh, you know, I think we're ready to vote. I'll be voting first. I, I wanted to say something. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Fourier, uh, Fourier, the, I am the crime victims advocate on this board representing crime victims. You're that's not right. hearing from the little girl right now. You're not hearing from her daddy. He trusted you with his daughter, okay? And I, I think that there, I mean, there's no DA or anybody else here to speak for this child. But um, you say you've handed it over to God and you've been able to forgive yourself and you're doing all these programs and everything. That's fine. But that little girl, that was the ultimate betrayal and her innocence was lost. She will never get it back. There's no cleansing for her. Uh, recidivism rate for what you've done is very high, sadly. So that's a big problem for other children. Um, and thank God for the school, because this went on for two years and nobody seemed to notice, but a teacher at the school and then they called the police. Or this, no, I, I don't even know how long this baby would have suffered from something like this. So um, I understand your brother's upset, and I understand your brother loves you, and I don't, and I understand that completely. But I don't know. I think you just started. You were a grown man with a little girl. I just can't even go there, other than to say I feel so sorry for that little girl. So you know, on behalf of on behalf of the victim. That's all I have to say. All right. Uh, you want to go ahead and vote? Yeah, I vote to uh, to deny your parole based upon strong opposition and the crime itself. Mr. Freeman? Um, I concur because I don't think you've served enough time for what has happened. Uh, as she said, you took the innocence away from a very young girl. And uh, you have adamant victim opposition, so my vote is to deny. Mr. Foray, I, I do agree. My vote, uh, you have not completed the sex offender treatment program. I, I, I uh, 
could not vote in your favor until that has been completed. Uh, I, my vote today also is to deny based on the opposition that I mentioned to you. Uh, I would recommend that you ask to enroll in a victim awareness program. There's lots of victims in your case, the little girl, as well as your own family, and also a thinking for change class. You will have the opportunity, I believe, yeah, you'll have the opportunity to apply for another parole hearing, but you can't do that until after you finish uh, the sex offender treatment, and I would recommend these other programs. Today, sir, your parole is being denied. Good luck to you, sir. Uh, Warden Bickham, that concludes our business, I believe, at your facility. Yes, that's how I feel right now. This is the first time that I am seeing Mrs. Stapleton. I think it's it, it's Carolyn. I'll have to find out how to pronounce her first name. Unbelievable. So I know most of you, the majority of you know that the prior victim's advocate was Mr. Roche. But because when the new governor was elected and he handpicks who's going to be on the board, Mr. Roche stepped down. And up until now, we haven't seen his replacement or if there even would be a replacement. And now we see who it is, and I don't think she could have made a more supreme entrance. She checks all the boxes for me. <sighs> to start, she brings up the victim, the survivor, how no one is there for her, which we see all too often. And then she even brings up that the DA is not present. How often have we raged on this channel, in the comment section, in the chat, of course myself, about where is the DA? They'll show up for a purse snatching charge for a bank, you know, a bank robbery for sure, a possession with intent to distribute, but when it's a child, nowhere to be found. And she brought it up. I think that is the first time we have ever heard those words spoken. Then what, what else does she go on to say? She goes on to say that Unfortunately, the recidivism rate for your type of offense is high. It's like, <laughs> she said it. This is something that also we've been screaming about for years now. When they come up there and they say, well, you have a low risk score. And we, and we, we say, what? The, what? He, he, he's been doing this to people who do this to children don't, don't have low risk scores. The, 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 the data says that they don't have low risk scores. No, 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 no. But you don't understand everyone, the world. See, we have these PhDs that uh, made this algorithm. And this algorithm says that because he has no write-ups and because it's his first um, offense uh, and he took programs, he has a low risk score. Yeah, but but the data says that anyone who does this to a child has a high... No, 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 no. Trust our, our low risk score. And it's like, we're not sheeple. We've been yelling about it. We're angry about it. And finally, we hear a parole board member state the facts. How long did it take? Gosh, those words were so good to hear. Let's read a little bit about our bio. And those of you can see I'm not in my normal environment. It's because I'm not. I'm traveling. I was trying to get my that virtual background to go, but the lighting made me look like a ghost. And then I realized the wall behind me kind of looks a little bit like, so I, I'm doing it like this. I hope you can hear me okay. And, you know, I, I'm I'm still traveling, but Richard 
wrote me and he said, man, do the new victims advocate did a mic drop. You got to check it out. And I'm glad I did because, and I just couldn't, I had to stop everything I was doing and make a stream for tonight because I, I think that there could be so much therapeutic, something therapeutic about this that I think a lot of us needed. Um, especially listening to those Connecticut hearings. So her background is, is, you know, really perfect. I love small bios, people with large bios. I don't know. It's not my thing. I think smaller is more. And in this case, I think it's quite nice. And it says, so here's her, her, her experience, and it is perfect for her role as a victim's advocate, in my opinion. Caroline Stapleton retired from the East Baton Rouge Sheriff's Office in 2014 with over two decades of experience in the Crime Victims Assistance Services. During her tenure at the EBR Victims Assistance Division Director, she was awarded the National Sheriff Association's Award for Crime Victims Services and the National Crime Victim Rights Week Community Awareness Grant. And that's what I would say. If I'm going to the grave, do I want an Emmy, an Oscar, actually, oof, or do I want these awards on my tombstone? And it goes on that even since her retirement, she still, of course, continued working. Um, Ms. Stapleton has served in various capacities in victim services, including a position in the 16th Judicial District Attorney. Uh, and so she worked with the district attorney. And she also served on the Crime Victims Reparation Board. So she's always uh, focused on the, the survivors, the victims, uh, representing the 6th con Congressional District um, under the administration of both Governor Bobby Jindal and Governor John Bell. Edwards. This is what I call a qualified superstar for being a victim's advocate. And I love Mr. O'Shea and he is Miss, Mr. O'Shea, Miss Jackson, forever have a place in my heart. And I think Mr. O'Shea did a stellar job as a victim's advocate. Um, so I'm not going to compare the two. I don't want to do that. But I am very happy that his replacement um is up for the job and i also love mr mirabella i, I love his energy you know he it, it's something we can take for granted we see him here and there but he always maintained this energy which is very admirable um okay in my opinion and then we go on let's talk about the hearing a little bit it starts off with the classic uh manipulative roach where the roach says uh to miss renazza Oh, I'm here because of molestation of a juvenile. And Mr. Knotts is like, well, their record indicates that you actually, you know, went full, you know, the full thing. And he goes, I've only pled to molestation of a juvenile. That's what it states on my record. <laughs> and then Mr. Knotts says, how old was your victim? He says, I think she was 12. Or did he say 13? But it's like, I think. It's like, really, dude? I think. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we always, you know, we see these things all the time. It's like a broken record. And then 10 seconds later, he goes on to say that he's, 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 uh, he has remorse and he's taken accountability. So right after he basically takes zero accountability, not basically, he takes zero accountability um, for what he actually has done. He goes on to say he takes accountability. But what's interesting enough is that his supporter, his brother, we say birds of a feather flock together, and I guess they're also born together. Um, I, it, we see it all the time. We see it all the time. But it still doesn't cease to amaze me at the callousness and narcissistic I guess, approach to it and just the me, me, me attitude. He goes on this long speech, which, I mean, Miss Ronasa eventually cut him off, but I think cut him off five minutes too late, where he starts to break down and cry. And he's crying 
because his elderly parents, I mean, he's elderly. This is, you know, this is a part of life. It's called a circle of life. It's like you, you, you talk about this with your therapist, not at the parole board. Oh, I had such a resentment for my brother because I had to take care of my parents when they were dying and I had to take care of their estate. And it's like, yeah. Okay. Are you really breaking down in tears over the resentment you felt because you had to do extra work on your own? Are you freaking kidding me? He uses the words. He actually uses the words that that experience left a deep emotional blow that we will never recover from. You know, and that's why I just thank goodness for having our victim's advocate come in here and just set the record straight. A deep emotional blow that we'll never recover from. How about the little girl? See, those words can be, they need to be moved over and framed so that it's being spoken by the DA, spoken by a victim's advocate, but not by the brother of the monster of the cockroach. And it's just, we see it over and over again where there's a complete lack of understanding of the pain and the world that was changed for that young child. to find out that it was really someone at the school that picked up on it and made the move. And I'm glad that, I am glad that that part was brought up as well by Miss Stapleton. One more thing, I guess Miss Stapleton checked three boxes that really um, made me fall in love with her instantly. She brings up the fact that the DA is not there. She brings up the fact that he has a high chance of recidivism and she pronounces it programs. So she's got the three from me and um, I can imagine most of you are feeling a similar way. I'm looking forward to seeing more of her, I, I am. And we'll do another hearing after this. Thank you again, Richard, for recommending it. And um, I want to give a very special and long belated um, thank you to our very special mods who I simply do not thank enough. They have, you know, as you can see, I've been on the road and MIA and they have held the ship steady. It's not something that should be taken for granted. You can't just have a stream that is that has no one monitoring it. It's very dangerous for a YouTube channel. If uh, a YouTube will punish a channel that has a chat that is that goes haywire, um, that has people that has trolls that are saying things, right? So to have Christina, to have Jam Jam, and to have Carol in there, um, and just for me to know that I can just trust um, them to run the ship, and of course, beautiful community that. I love you all very much. So let's move on to the next hearing. That was enough of my little saga pitch. And there you go. Classified as the sixth felony offender. Your most recent sentencing is March of 2003. Uh, distribution of cocaine, six counts, one count of distribution of marijuana, and attempted failure to register as a sex offender. Uh, you have a parole eligibility date, which is December 21st of this year, you have an adjusted good time date, which is May 9th of 2025. Is that information correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. All right. Mr. Uh, Richard, so tell us about the sex offender registration, the, the uh, failure to register as a sex offender. What happened with that? I have, I have a problem remembering the dates. You know, it's like it's 
it's not my first time, but the report had called my, one of my sisters and tell him, remind me of the dates. I don't know if I was in the hospital at the time, because I had surgery on my hand. Twice, I had two surgeries on my hand. I probably was in the, in the hospital at the time, but I, I have probably remembering the dates, you know? Yeah, but it's not your sister's. I do see, you did say you had, that's not the first time it happened, because I see that in 2017, you also had a failure to register. Yes, ma'am. That's the uh, same reason because you forgot the date? Yeah, I mean, you know, I have I have probably remember dates because I have, you know, I have a lot of doctor appointments. I have black home. I got hit in my head when I was two years old and I went to brain damage. And I had probably remember. So they usually call my, one of my sisters, Sherry or Portia or Deborah, and remind me to go. Okay. So tell us about your drug issues. Six months of distribution of cocaine. Yeah, I used to I used to sell drugs, but that's that's not in my you know that's not I don't sell drugs no more. You know. You're in jail. Yeah, I don't I don't sell them at all no more. I, I work. I do a lot of inside work. You know, I do like landscaping. I do housework. So, but this the sentencing, let me say, it was in 2023. So just a year ago, or well, I guess it would have been 2022, just a year ago, you started doing the landscaping work. No, I've been I've been doing that all my life. You know, I do I do um I see, I see. You were sent I I, I see what it is. That arrest was in 2004. And you pled guilty in 2005. You were sentenced to 25 years. Okay. Um, you have a very extensive criminal record, Mr. Mr. Richard. You have, and it includes crimes of violence, which is very concerning. You know, dates the first one I saw was 1983, that was armed robbery. You do have a history of sex offended, sex offenses. Um, I see in 2002 and three assault. Uh, or injury to family members. I think you were in Texas at the time. So you, you have, tell us about. Why all the violence? So I, know, I never had an assault charge in my life. You never had a sex charge? Assault? You say assault, assault. charge? Assault, yeah. I never That's had an assault charge. I never had an assault charge. I'm not, none of my family members. This says, April of 2003, by the Round Rock, Texas Police Department, assault causing injury to family members. That's not no, you? I, no, ma'am. That's not... That's, I never, I never hit one of my family members. Then there was another one, September 29th, 2002, in uh, Colleen, Texas. Assault causing bodily injury. I never had, I never had an assault charge nowhere in Colleen, Texas. I stayed you with my sister, Sherry. Been in Colleen, Texas before? Yeah, I stayed with, she should be on the panel right there. She put that lock in on. I never had a, I never had a, um, a violent charge with none of my, of my people. All right. Um, so tell us about your time there at, at Rayburn. What, what, what have you done since you've been there? Well, I just, I, I've been there about seven months. I just did pre-release, you know, and that's about, that's about it. I'm, I'm, um, backlog for parent, parenting, and um, a few other classes that I know of. Well, good. Did you get any good time credits for your pre-release? Yeah, I do see it. CTRP. Yeah, you did. I see that. So you're not enrolled in anything right now? It got me backlogged. I think I think they said I was backlogged for a few classes, parenting, a few other classes, anger management, or whatever. You know, they said. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Do you see uh, mental health? Staff there? Do you see a social worker or a psychiatrist or anybody? Uh, no, not not since I've been here. Okay. Before you got there, were you under the care of a, a mental health professional? I go, I go to I go to mental health on the street. You know, Medicaid and all that. You know, I go to mental health on the street. Yeah, when I'm free. You were on the street. Were you taking any mental health medication? Yeah, I took nerve pills. 
Yeah, but you don't have the need for that now, do you? Or do you? No, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I see that you've had no write ups during this period of incarceration, at least. That's good. Uh, and, and you did living in balance before you were released on good time. You took that program? Yes, ma'am. All right. Warden, what can you tell us about Mr. Richard? Uh, Kevin's got a vision impairment. Uh, he doesn't work. He does some light work inside. Uh, when you do ask him about this stuff, he can remember the changes or mistakes you made. Uh, outside of that, his record pretty much speaks for itself. All right, thank you. Have you any questions? All right. Um, well, before we ask the DA for his comments, Mr. Richard, is there anything uh, you said your sister was supposed to join us? We don't have her as listed today, so she wasn't able to, to join in, I guess. So is there anything you'd like to say to us before we ask the DA for his comments? Hey, hey, um, you know, I'm sorry for, for any part of my calls because I forgot to register. And, um, I'm very sorry if I heard anybody any kind of way about, you know, forgot to register. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. Mr. Meyer, we'd like to hear from you. Oh, you're yeah. on mute. You're on mute. Yeah. Yeah. I can't hear you. All right, is that better? Uh, All right. Yes. Sorry, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA in Jefferson Parish. We're opposed at this time, uh, Mr. Richard. I think he needs some more programming to help him when he gets out, so he's got the tools to stay out. Um, you know, he's got a. Uh, he was released on a good time, um, and then was revoked for failure to register for a second time. Uh, poor supervision while he was the times he's been under supervision. Um, and I'm glad to see that that during this incarceration, he hadn't had any write-ups yet, but the prior incarceration between 20, 2005 and 2015, he had 45 write-ups, pretty much one every year. Um, and all of the programming he has taken really has been prior to this incarceration. Uh, I think he needs some long-term substance abuse. I think he needs some help with uh, anger management. Um, he's got a history of of, of some violent acts with his criminal record, you know, theft, rapes, assaults, uh, um, and a long history of selling uh, selling drugs, which I think the, the substance abuse would be very helpful for that. So for that, those reasons, we're opposed at this time to his request. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, all right, Mr. Richard, we're prepared to vote. I'll be voting first. Mr. Richard, uh, I'm glad to know that you're backlog for some classes. I do agree with the district attorney's office that I think you would benefit from some additional programs. You do have a good time date, which is a little over a year away, May 9th of next year. So if you do get to do programming, you'll get to earn a little bit of that good time to have an earlier release. You have a history of revocation. You've been revoked at least three times. Again, this is not, I hear what you say, you forget the dates, but you, you, um, this is not your first failure to register as a sex offender, and that's a pretty serious offense. So my vote today is going to be to deny your paroles for those reasons. Mrs. Stapleton? Uh, I agree with my board member. Mr. Freeman? I concur due to criminal history and supervision. All right. So today, Mr. Richard, your uh, parole has been denied, sir. Good luck to you. Well, that's kind of uneventful. We'll do another hearing after this one, but I'll do, I will go through the notes that Richard shared. And there's one one thing that he pointed out. You know, on 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 a registry, they share aliases of names. So many people have uh, different aliases, names that they go by in their neighborhoods. Um, this person's alias is if you can't make it up, Joe. Pecker. Who would have thought, right? 
So, it, it, you know, from what Richard Sheard, um, this guy, he's got all just, and, and we've heard just a taste of it on the, uh, a piece of it on the board, but he was initially locked up in 1985 for forcible sexual assault attempted. And you know that when they write attempted, it's because he did a plea deal or whatever. And, uh, man, he served until 2002 when he was released. What's interesting is that Richard also shows that he has an attempted sexual assault on a 14-year-old girl in Texas. Where I'm a little confused about that is that the dates that it shows there is 1995, which... Um, you know, I, I don't quite understand because... I thought he was still locked up. Now, it could be that I'm not understanding the information I'm looking at. It could be that he was released on parole and then <laughs> assaulted this, you know, girl and then got relocked up on the revocation charge and they never actually charged. I, I don't know. But, um, yeah, this is a pretty uneventful hearing. We're going to do, uh, but as you can see, they revoked. They <laughs> said, you, can't, you know, you got to register. You got to follow the rules. And frankly, it's scary. Just listen to his record, and um, and you say, "Is it really worth it to, to, I don't know, to to let someone out who just has such a long record?" Um, and Randy the DA showed up, and for those of you who are wondering, say, "Wait a minute, why did Randy the DA show up for this and not for the case we just saw?" And I, I at the beginning didn't understand this. It's um, the DAs are, are set by the parish. So if the, the girl in the last hearing we saw, it wasn't simply wasn't Randy's parish. Randy likes to show up. They they have like, I guess, a doctrine or um, their culture of showing up to all of the hearings regardless. It seems even regardless of severity, they just show up. Randy shows up. But I think Randy's fair. I like him um, as a DA. He seems when he feels that someone should get out, he... he he usually says it, um, I think at least. I, I like him. I like what I've seen. He's been consistent, I believe. Uh, so let's move to the next one. We're going to skip a day now to April 25th to today. Haven't seen this hearing yet, but I do see on the notes um, from Richard that he's in there for also crimes of a child. We'll see if they talk about that or not. I had the wrong packet. So let me read the identifying information. You're classified as a second felony offender. You uh, are currently serving a five-year sentence. You were sentenced. Um, let's see, you have indecent behavior with a juvenile sentencing date in East Baton Rouge, July of 2021. You have another sentencing uh, for unauthorized entry. You were initially sentenced in 2017, but you were revoked uh, given probation and revoked again uh, for the new, at the new felony conviction. Uh, let's see, your parole eligibility was October 16 of 2023. You don't earn good time and your full term date is January 16, 2025. Does all that sound right? Yes, ma'am. Right. Your case has been assigned to Mrs. Stapleton. Would you answer her questions? Yes, ma'am. All right, good morning, sir. Good morning. I wanted to ask you a question. I guess we'll start with the first with the burglary. What what went on there? Um, I was, I believe I was 16, just turning 17, and I was hanging with some guys, and it was um drug influenced. You know what I mean? Um, I didn't really have anything to do with the initial burglary, but um you know, growing up um, around uh, King Bradford and Baton Rouge, you know what I'm saying, is uh, you're, you're held to a specific standard, you know, and um, I made a mistake, you know, and it's a term, you know what I'm saying, real nigga, as they call it. I wanted to be one, so um, we refer to it as taking the lick for your partners, you know, you understand? So uh, that was my first initial mistake. Then um, the re uh, the unauthorized entry, um, this was back in 2017. You know, I had just come home from um, serving a little time for the burglary. And the flood had happened in 2016. 
I never was really able to get my feet on solid ground. So I wound up living on the street. So I was staying in this building off college. I had a job at the time, actually. I was working at the IHOP, you know, I was trying to um, have some sort of revenue coming in, you know, just so that I'm not a complete and total disaster of a man. And um, I wound up going to jail for that, you know, basically it was um, um, not squatting, but, uh, you know, I was, um, I was basically homeless staying in this building off college. And then I wound up, you know, I come home in 2020. And then, you know, I seen your scratchy ear about the whole un indecent behavior with a juvenile. Now, ma'am, okay, I've been, I've pretty much served all my friends in jail. You know, I have never did any homosexual activities, you know, but I noticed that like Matthew chapter seven, verse one says, judge you not that ye be judged. You know, how can I judge you, you know, for doing this when I was a thief growing up, you know? But I noticed that the over homosexualization of young boys, you know, and it, it it's it's a long story, you know, ma'am. But they caught me with some drugs because I, I I've, I've suffered with addiction since I was about seventeen, you know. And um, they they told me that um, basically they gave me an ultimatum, this or that, you know. But they had they made it seem as if you know I was just gonna do this. Then I was going to have to register for five years. And then I'd come home roughly two years prior after, you know, I, I really kind of got duped on the whole situation, you know, but um, I am not a pervert. I am not a pervert. You know what I'm saying? And now I'm, I'm pretty much, you know, just pretty much duped myself with this whole situation, you know? So, um, I've, I've, I've made mistakes in life, you know, and this being one of the big ones, um, if I could do it all over again, I'm pretty sure anybody in my current predicament would, you know, but this is, uh, I've learned not to say it is what it is. I learned to say it is what you make. And unfortunately, this is what I've made it. You understand? Um, one question though, while you're saying all this, let's get to, did you rape a juvenile? No, ma'am. So that's a false allegation. Yes, ma'am. And and you accept you accepted the charge for it, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. And then later on, I see where um, you've abs absconded in 2021, and your parole was revoked. How about all of that? Did that? Um, that was your father not, I'm not exactly sure how I absconded. You know, when um, I forget um my parole officer's name. Okay. And hear me out. Um, I would come visit her often. Granted okay. that I was only out there for, from Thanksgiving day to January 16, 2020. Okay. You know, I, I believe that I roughly seen her, if not once a week, once every other week. And then um, when I came to jail, she, she told me to revoke my, she told me not to revoke, you know, so that's probably why it probably looks as if it took forever for me to um, revoke the pro pro probation or parole or whatever it was I was on. Okay, well, I see where you've taken quite a few classes and uh, you take sex offender one, two, three, and four class, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, and victim awareness, correct? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. I'm unaware no. of what victim awareness is. Okay, well, that, that's an excellent class. And the reentry and anger management. You did you take that, or did you take more classes? That I'm just not aware of it. Um, I've taken reentry before, but I've yet to take it again, ma'am. Okay, anger management. They um the facility that I'm in, they would not place me in other classes due to my offender class. Okay, so value. You know, ma'am. So you've taken the sex offender class, right? And then earlier the the uh, reentry class. Those are the two classes. So yes. I understand. Okay. Um, you do have strong uh, law enforcement opposition. You do. And victim opposition also. Yes. So it's something that you should know. Um, I'm going to pass it along to my uh, other board members. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you do? What are you doing now? Do you have, are you in class or do you have, um, what do you do all day? Um, pretty much nothing, you know, I'm literally just 
land. You know, I've been praying for this moment here. You know, rather, uh, rather my parole get accepted or denied, my prayers have been answered here. You know, I'm not going to throw the whole Jesus mumbo jumbo in your face trying to all let him free. No, regardless of the fact of the matter is, you know what I mean? What, uh, so no matter what happens today, you have a release date of January 16th in next year. So what, what are your plans? You, you, uh, on your master prison record, it shows your address as being homeless. So what, what arrangements have you made for housing? Um, my mother, she's pretty much been with me through this whole ride. So I do have somewhere to go, you know, some Is sort of stable work. Uh, no, ma'am, it's in Walker. Okay, so that's good. You, you plan to move away from the Baton Rouge area. That's a good thing. Um, respectively. Um, I plan on doing the necessary steps of these next 15 years, you know, with the registration and all that. Because I... You, I've learned that you have to not want to come back to this place, you know, because it's it's been like these past four years have been like some of the worst days of my life, you know, but it's been a real journey of mine, you know. Now, granted that I understand the whole offend the class situation, you know, um, it's been a lot of doubt in my mind that um y'all would even much this meeting would even much happen, you know, because um, I've like, I've heard the tales, you know, sex offenders don't, they don't get parole. And, you know, like I said, it is what I've made it, you know, but um, my plans are really just to just live life. I mean, I've, I've spent the majority of my 20s incarcerated. You know, I started coming to jail when I was 17. You know, I, I really never gave myself a shot. You know, and it's just now, you know, just live until the end. So, um, is it working for today? I am. Mrs. Stateton will be voting. Um, a lot of what you said makes a lot of sense for the future of your life. And I, I, I really hope that you are able to do it and prepare to do it. Um, I'm not going to give you parole today. And instead, I think the full-time release is good for you. I hope you can get even a, another class, especially a victim awareness class that they offer it there. I hope you can get into that. And um, your full-time date is 116.25, as you stated. So maybe you've got enough time to do something like that. But also when you get out, I hope that you will attend Narcotics Anonymous and AA meetings because I know that you had said that that is the root of your problem. Yes, ma'am. And right now where you're at, you're not surrounded by that. And I don't care where you go nowadays, drugs are everywhere and alcohol's on the countertop. So, yeah. Yeah, it, well, yeah, I know I'm hearing you. So I want you to take care of yourself and the people around you. Homelessness is terrible. And it's wonderful that your mother's going to take you in. And I wish you well. I really do. Thank you. Mr. Freeman? I concur. Um, yeah, I enjoyed speaking with you and hearing from you, uh, Mr. Bowie. I do agree with Mrs. Stapleton. I, you know, I believe that this, this joust, as they say, may have saved your life. Um, and I'm glad that you have somewhere to go with your mom in January of next year and make the best of the rest of your life. Good luck to you. My vote today is to deny. Thank but you. Wish, wish you well. Yeah, be blessed. Thank you. That uh, concludes our business in Franklin. So we're going to sign off at 10.07. Okay, so just wait till I get into the facts of this case of how vicious of a crime that he had committed to get this little baby five year sentence and it'll just get so fired up. You know what was interesting about this case? Maybe, maybe you 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 picked up on it, but actually you might so the way that it started, I was watching it in real time and I didn't record all of that because it, it was like a five minute, but basically they started reading the information of this case. And it was a different name, a different crime. And I'm looking at him with the, the cross necklace. And I'm like, 
that's interesting. We never see someone who wears, you know, who who's doesn't who's not like a chomo. Like that's just not something that we see. And then it turns out that they had the wrong name. They said, "Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. We have the wrong information." And then they called up the correct name, and sure enough, and you know, it's it's so classic. You know, they try to hijack a religion um, for the manipulation. They think that they can pull it over, and it's so classic. They don't see how ridiculous they look, right? Um, but it's like something that we we consistently see. And, uh, you know, it's sad. It's sad that we have to, you know, nickname it in the spreadsheet, the Chomo necklace. And, and I say this with sadness in my heart, right? Um, that, it's, that it's a necklace that is hijacked. The crucifix is hijacked by the worst of the worst in an attempt to manipulate those who others. And, you know, they denied him, right? I, I don't know what they were saying. Wow, that was a nice conversation. Was it just to be nice? I would have had liked to have seen our victim's advocate give him uh, a stern talking to, especially wait till I tell you what it is that he did to a child. Um, but he's just talking word salad. I mean, mumble, jumble, this, that. I have no, I, I really, I, I lost a few brain cells listening to what he was saying. I can't, I couldn't keep track. And again, it would have been quite funny, I think, if it wasn't for the fact that he got a five-year sentence for doing just the most evil deed the most trauma and it's it, and it makes you say like it's just proof again that the da's do not care uh, about children they don't care about much really because they kicked the ball down the road for five years and that's nothing so he he, he was arrested on third degree sexual assault charges in baton rouge and this is only 2020 january 17th 2020 he got a five year sentence let's go over what it is that he did to this child so Baton Rouge police arrested a homeless man Thursday for allegedly sex sexually assaulting a juvenile in an abandoned Baton Rouge building. So he faces third degree sexual assault charges after a woman notified police that she saw a man fitting Bowie's description, chasing a juvenile with, from a building with a stick. The complainant told police that the juvenile said he had been molested by the man chasing him, according to an affidavit. When police arrived, Bowie put his hands up and stated that he knew what he did was wrong. An officer wrote in the affidavit. Bowie told the officer, um, I, so now this is his story that he tells the officer. Well, a young boy in a school uniform approached him um, at the convenience store and asked him for a dollar. So he said that he gave the boy a dollar and walked away. And the boy followed him and asked him to be his boyfriend. This is what he tells the police. Bowie said that he refused, but the boy kept asking. He was like, oh, I'm not going to be your boyfriend. So he told the boy to go with him to the abandoned home. And Bowie said that that's when he told the boy to remove his pants um, so that he could start. So, and the boy did. And then he said he started to whip the boy. So he was, you know, he was whipping the boy because the boy wanted to be his boyfriend. And that's what caused the boy to run away. And he decided to chase. So Bowie said he chased the boy out with the stick. And that's what happened. Now, the victim, the survivor, this boy, tells the truth what happened. He tells the police officer that Bowie dragged him into the building, forced him to perform oral sex on him. Then the juvenile said that he pulled that he was pulled down his pants after Bowie told him to, but then ran from the building after Bowie started hitting him. The juvenile's mother told police that the boy that the boy may have the juvenile's mother told police that the boy may have mental issues. Bowie was booked into East Baton Rouge Parish Office. Um, why would that the boy? I don't understand, but. You know that the after all that, that's what the the boy's poor mother, you know, the poor boy's mother says, isn't that's not traumatizing enough? And thank you, Richard, for the information. And and he has a lot of other charges, of course, that Richard shared. I mean, it's just a long wrap of of charges. Um.
it's it's uh and and then you give five years and then you know there's no da and i don't know the vic i don't know the victim's advocate didn't didn't um didn't state the same thing and this is a day later so i'm a little disappointed i would have liked for her to have kind of given him a, a hard talking to um about this case and i don't know did i miss something is the reason she didn't but i guess we'll we'll have to see more and more of these cases and see how they all play out as we get to know the different board members um but really the fault falls on on the the da in this case now i i get they say okay well it's gonna be really hard to prosecute the you know the first they talk to the guardian and the guardian says immediately that the boy has mental issues like okay that's um that's obviously gonna throw a wrench in everything but it's still you no know, to, to put this man back out in the streets I, it's you really you think everything's gonna work out yeah, he's gonna go moving with his mother because he says so. Like, like you're just kicking the ball down the road. Someone else is gonna get hurt, and uh, and then people wonder, wow, why? I wonder why. I wonder why you know these bad things happen. That's just my two cents. What do I know? Mr. Pram, you're classified as a second felony offender. You're currently serving a 20-year sentence for indecent behavior with a juvenile. You were sentenced in East Baton Rouge in March of 2015. You have a parole eligibility date, which is passed. It was November 16, 2023. Your full term date is November 17, 2033. Is that information correct, sir? As far as I know, yes, I, I wasn't aware of that the parole last year <laughs> well it was, that's your eligibility date i guess you just didn't get scheduled for it until now um right. so mr prim uh let's talk about how old are you sir 75 75 Thanks. and uh what concerns me i'll be honest with you i look i reviewed your record your case was assigned to me that's why i'm taking the lead on the interview I read your record and I mentioned earlier that you are a second felony offender and I see that your first offense was also a sex offense. Also what? Sex offense. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And that was in 2000, early 2000s? Mm, I guess so, yes, ma'am. No, uh, no ma'am, I wasn't convicted of anything. Uh, let's see. Well, what was your first offense? Why, why are you uh, classified as a second felony offender? There was, <clears throat> excuse me, there was, uh, there was charges brought against me and we went to court. I'm, I'm having trouble remembering what, what that was, what, uh, Help you out. Let me get to that page. Well, at any rate, the record reflects that your first felony offense was also a sex offense. Let me, I'll tell you the date. Uh, April, April of 2003, April 9th was the date you were arrested in East Baton Rouge, and that was a molestation of a juvenile. You pled guilty to cruelty to juveniles and were sentenced to seven years. Okay. I hear a member? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. And this offense, which occurred in 2013, you are originally charged with aggravated rape. Lord. And you pled guilty to indecent behavior. Okay. So so um so you've done about nine years of your sentence. Ten. Ten years of your 20 year sentence. Yes, ma'am. And um, so let's talk a little bit about what happened, and then we'll move on to talk about what you've done since you've been in jail for 10 years. So the victim in this case was, um, how old was she? There was no rape. There how was... old was the victim? This my... My, question. my question is, how old was the victim at the time? That's what I'm trying to 
You don't remember? No, ma'am. Okay, she was six. Six, six years. Six years old. Ooh. And, and um, I think this this uh, little girl called you Papa. You remember that? Yes, ma'am. I had quite a few call me Papa. <laughs> Right. Well, as you can imagine, we, you have very strong opposition from the district attorney's office, from the sheriff, uh, the chief of police, and the victim victim's family to any early release consideration for you. If you you'd act like you don't remember what happened, but if you could speak to the victim's family or the victim, what would you say to them? Um. Really, I, I don't know at the moment. Uh, I would like to have, <laughs> I've thought about this here lately. I'd love to see those children, but I, I just tell them that I love them. That's all I know. But you didn't do anything wrong? Uh, no, ma'am. Why did you plead guilty? Well, the, 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 the thinking at the, at the time was that they were giving these children so much trouble with all this nonsense, and I, I just didn't want any any more any more trouble to the children. Okay. That. So, so a, go ahead, sir. No, that that's that that's about that's about the gist of it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what what since you've been in jail for ten years? What uh, have you been doing? What you have a job there? Yes, ma'am. I work in garment factory. What do you do at the garment factory? I sew. What do y'all make? Well, let's see. When I was at Hunt, we made blue jeans. Right, right now, right now I'm making. I'm I'm hemming sheets. Okay. And how long have you had that job? Uh, let's see. My second year at Hunt, I started there. I guess almost nine years. It's been eight years, I think. What kind of classes have you taken? Have you taken any classes in the last 10 years? Yes, ma'am. I took, uh, well, I sent, I sent, I sent you a, a copy of all my, all my uh, certificates. Right. I, I just want you to state it on the record, sir. Okay. I took, uh, Let's see, there's one I was just looking at here. Okay, I took risk, what is it, risk management. It was a four, a four course deal. It was about two years. I, I, I was in it for three years. That's the sex offender treatment. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you completed all four phases of the sex offender treatment. Yes, ma'am. What did you learn from that class? And did you, did you any major takeaways? Um, I, it's hard to say. I, I remember. It was in 2018, I believe, or 19, rather, finished. Right. I stayed at it. Let's see, I was in it. The four phases you finish in about a year and a half. So I was in it over almost three years. And I, I garnered from that through the instructor, he kept us in touch of things that were going on outside within the system, within the court system and all. Uh, as far as my wrongdoing, I just, uh, Want to be more aware of what I'm doing and what 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 things look like. So you also took in 2016. You took and completed Living in Balance one and two. That's a substance abuse class. Mm -hmm. Get out yeah. of that. Uh, well, I'm an alcoholic. I've been I've been an alcoholic since 1982. I've been involved. In, I was involved in uh, AA. AA. For well, I've been I've been dry now for forty. Let's see if I make it to September second. It'll be forty. 
42 years, 43. Uh, I haven't had a drink in 42 years. Let's put it like that. The, the, the thinking, uh, yes, ma'am, I, I learned a lot through AA and reading the big book and being in touch with my higher power. Mm -hmm. You uh, also took the victim accountability letter training. Did you ever write a victim accountability letter? You know, I think I did. I, I think I did, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there was a counselor at, at Hunt that I talked to several times on that, and I think I gave her a copy, but I'm not, I, I can't remember. Well, we, it'll uh, be in the, in, the, in the letter bank if you did. That's good to know. Uh, All right. I, I don't uh, have a copy of it. That's okay. Uh, Ms. Cook, anything? Can you can you tell us anything about uh, Mr. Prim? Um, we there's no write-ups on him or anything um, since he's been here. We have no trouble at all. He does work in the garment factory. Um, like I said, no trouble at all here. So there's not a lot to tell you, but uh, he's he's done good here. Good, good to hear. He also yeah. took anger management too. Okay. Yeah, I do see that. I think 2018. Yeah. No. Mr. Prim, is there anything you want to say to us before we vote? Uh, well, uh, I hope you uh, think that I have progressed a little bit, but I'm I'm not sure in that in that you know I can't tell you. All I can tell you is I trust in God to take things as it needs to be done at the moment. I have to try to learn to live in the moment, so here I am. All right, Mr. Prim, thank you for that. I uh, think we're ready to vote. I'll be voting first. I am concerned about you, Mr. Prim. You haven't taken any accountability for what happened in either of your sex crime convictions and that's concerning to me mm -hmm. uh, uh i i do appreciate that miss cook says you're doing well and i'm i'm glad you were able to take the sex offender treatment class but for me uh based on the opposition that's been expressed strong opposition by law enforcement and others my vote today is to deny your parole mrs stapleton uh, i agree with um uh, mrs renato mr freeman uh, due to the seriousness of the offense and strong victim and law enforcement opposition, I vote to deny. All right, Mr. Prim, we wish you well. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Sir. Cockroach. You know, this... So, Richard Richard has a spreadsheet where he lists the names and then he highlights in red for those who are, have sex crimes. Now, I, I've been going through this stream while it's in real time. Normally, Richard puts a timestamp. Um, but, but in this case, because it's in real time, you can't put a timestamp. So I'm, I'm looking for this specific hearing because I want to pack it all into this one hearing for tonight. And I'm scrolling through, and I see him. And I instantly knew. You know, it's like the same thing with the, I saw, I saw the cross, and I said, Okay, and then I saw him. It's like, what else is he in there for? So I stopped at the hearing, and sure enough, that was the, the name I was looking for in the spreadsheet. Something else Richard pointed out in the spreadsheet, and I want to show you, this gave me, this just freaked me out. Listen to this. Listen to how he answers Miss Renatz's question about the situation. Little girl called you Papa. You remember that? Yes, ma'am. I had quite a few call me Papa. <laughs> right. How creepy is that laugh? And when you think about the connotation of what he just said, I had a, quite a few little girls call me Papa with a chuckle. It's sad, but they, it could only mean. And and we didn't need to hear him say it, you know, to translate. Oh yeah, I had a bunch of girls that I used to sexually assault. That's really all it meant. 
We know that. I mean, he's a second time offender. I know the low risk score he definitely got when he, you know, he, what was it? He only had a seven year sentence for his initial offense. This is the TA's fault. This is the system's fault. They don't care about children. How does an old man, a roach, get himself in the situation where he harms a child and then they give him just a tiny little, you know, slap on the wrist so he can get back out and do it again? And do it again. So what was it? His first charge was, uh, let me see, for four nine in twenty in two thousand and three. He then gets, he again only gets caught again. In what, two thousand? Or maybe it was that this, okay, so hold on. Let me just clarify this for a second. Here, let's hear it from, let's hear it from Ms. Renatza. Uh, April, April of 2003, April 9th was the date you were arrested in East Baton Rouge. And that was a molestation of a juvenile. You pled guilty to cruelty to juveniles and were sentenced to seven years. Okay. I hear a member. Yes, ma'am. And this offense, which occurred in 2013, you were originally charged with aggravated rape. Lord. And you pled. And you know, and they still they keep giving him plea deals. And it's like so he 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 does the the charge to a child. <laughs> they give him plea deal just seven years because why give more than seven years for altering the life of a child? I'm sure he'll get rehabilitated with the programs. I mean, look at him. He's like, he, he he can't you hear all the accountability that he's taken and the idea that he's owning up to it? And he's actually such a good guy that he only agreed to the charges because of the poor kids, right? So let's just give him seven years. He gets out, assuming he serves all seven years, which is doubtful, but assuming he did, <laughs> and he's caught. Though let's not pretend to think that he just started. He's caught in 2019, sorry, 2013. He's caught again. And it's like, ah, what's the big deal? Let's just give him another plea deal where it's 20 years. And the, the DA will all them, it's, it's 20 years. He'll get parole eligibility after 10, if you can imagine that. And, you know, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? It's just a child. And uh, it's it's just not that we needed more proof that the system's broken. But it's, um, you know, this was another classic roach. Oh, I don't remember. Uh, he's like trying to think of what to say. He thinks that he's, he actually thinks that he can trick the parole board. He actually thinks that maybe he can be manipulative enough so that the parole board would forget um, or... I don't know, you know, the, it's just the, the, the criminal perverted mind that he that is in his slug brain. And but it's like who do we yell at? Do we yell at the roach? Do we yell at the monster or do we yell at the system? And in this case, it's just the system. They had a chance of protecting another child. And they blew it. They blew it by giving him a slap on the wrist, seven-year sentence. He immediately gets out. He immediately reoffends. He's caught a bunch of years later. They give him a 20-year sentence with parole eligibility after 10. Yeah, he's denied. He has a full term date of what? Of uh and thank you, Richard, for the information as always. What 2033? I mean, he has just another 10 years or so, nine years to get out, if I'm understanding that correctly. And there's, there, you know, he looks like he's in good health. He looks like he's in 10 years. He's still going to be able to re-offend. This is the time. You lock him up for life. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Oh, the DA is going to say, well, I have to go to trial, and that's going to be difficult. So go to trial. 
it's so clear to us. It's so clear to, you know, anyone with common sense, but. And I, again, wish I would have seen the victim's advocate rip him a new one. I don't know. We got to see it once at least. Um, maybe she thinks it's just not worth it. Maybe she sees that he's clearly, um, is the word sociopath. It's like, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe that's why again, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more from her as it goes, you know, maybe, yeah, I don't, I, I shouldn't give up the different scenarios. It's just possible that there are certain people you don't waste your breath on. And he's, but I would have liked to have heard, you know, a kind of Miss Jackson mic drop, just telling him that he's a monster, mm -hmm. um, which we've heard a few times, or Mr. O'Shea putting a man in his place. Sometimes, sometimes we just, they know people are watching this. So it's like, you can have that. You can say it just to give us, just say it. Uh, the, you know what? The, the little six year old girl is in here watching it. And now, what is she? She's 16. Maybe she is watching it. They don't know, right? For the small chance that she might be, they should say something. That's my opinion. Well, I think that we're going to call it a night. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, beautiful mods. Thank you, beautiful community. With that, I'll let you go.